Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, good morning to me. So today's topic, which I'm going to cover, uh, is competing risks. Uh, basically, this is a one type of, uh, you can consider the, this as an extension of yesterday's presentation, uh, basic uh, as a recurrent event or repeated event, some type of event. <clears throat> It's not moving. Oh, oops. No. Yeah. Competing risk uh, by definition, like uh, normally the situation arises when an individual experience more than one type of event. Um, or otherwise you can also think in terms of an occurrence of one type of event can hinder other occurrences of an event. In case of a non-fatal, so I will give you some examples basically, uh, so in a normal survival analysis situation, uh, you would find where you are interested in time to an event. And uh, that's the uh, left-hand side uh, chart here, which most, most of us are familiar with or very commonly used. Uh, people are followed up up to a time to an event and uh, then some are censored. Uh, but in a, a competing risk situation, you can have more than one type of event. So there is like uh, E1 is an event type one and E2, I put it as event type two. So most of the times what happens is like, uh, what we do is we use regular survival analysis uh, uh, for that type of situations, especially when you have a competing risk, we ignore the competing risk, assuming that they are okay, they are like censored and analyzed them. Um, so that has a problem. I'll talk, uh, give, give, give uh, reasoning why that is a problem. But uh, I also want to give uh, uh, the examples of competing risk, like uh, the situations can be uh, non-fatal events can be competing um, one example would be if, if somebody is smoking, I am, I'm working on a study currently, which is basically trying to, it's, it's adolescent, high risk adolescent uh, in New York City. We are trying to follow them in a cohort study and we are interested in how many of them are smoking marijuana or how many of them are trying to start smoking marijuana. Because uh, in uh, early this year, uh, there was a uh, law put up that there are marijuana, marijuana clinic or cannabis clinics are open and there is not going to be a punishment. So it's legal to get uh, a cannabis into a shop, walking into a shop. So there's a lot of change. So we wanted to find out what is the, uh, what is the uh, initiation of marijuana in these adolescents. The problem with that is like uh, we have other competing risks like um, uh, tobacco smoking is one or uh, you can also think about blunts. It's a combination of marijuana. Then there is a e-vaping is there. Uh, it's not just e-smoking e is there, uh, vaping, va vaping of uh, other combination of nicotine being consumed in addition. So they can compete over one over the other. So those are non-fatal. Uh, in other situation, competing risk arises or can be fatal. So yesterday I presented a, 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 a scenario where you have repeated events and death being a terminal event. So in this case, competing risk, you are trying to find one event and a death can be a terminal event and it can be a competing risk. Say for example, you are interested in uh, death due to cardiovas cardiovascular diseases. But sometimes people, when, you are, when they are in older age, they can die due to some other cause. So that could be a competing risk for that. So these are the situations where you, uh, the competing risk problem arise, okay? So I do want to give, there are different um, angles people have thought about this over the years. Uh, in fact, this, this book, uh, I put the second edition, uh, actual first edition was 1980. 
Um, so when they talked about competing risk, um, um, they gave like uh, the, each of the definitions for the competing risk, Calder Fritsch and Prentice gave uh, the individuals can experience more than one type of event. So it can be in a cancer patients, it can be local relapse. That means uh, you surgically remove or provide radiotherapy for a local, locally for a cancer where it occurred. It can come again there or it can come in a different place. So, so people can get multiple places the event, okay? The other school of thought, Gelman et al., they, what they looked at it as, as a hindrance. So it's, there is no, it's basically, they are saying in a regular survival analysis situation, normally we assume the event process and the censoring process are independent. So they say like they approached the competing risk as failure to achieving independence between the failure and the censoring process. And the most common realistic approach was presented uh, by Gulli et al. Uh, they defined the competing risk in terms of uh, either uh, the type of event, what you're looking at precludes the occurrences of another event, whatever in, under in, in investigation, or it alters the probability of an occurrence. So the first sentence is for a non-fatal event. The second sentence is more for a fatal event you can consider. So, so the definition where I put the blue, uh, competing is a, a risk is a type of event either precludes the occurrence of an event. So you can have a death if you're thinking in terms of uh, death. They can if you're if you're interested is looking at in cardiovascular patients, heart disease patients. If you're looking at an event. Uh, due to cardiovascular death in these patients, but some other causes comes back. So it is pre precluding the occurrence of the another event. You can think in terms. Similarly, if you're looking at, uh, I mentioned about local relapse in surgical or radiotherapy treat treated patients, uh, you are looking at local or other metastasis com comes there, then uh, you, can, you can think that precluding one another. But by coming, changing the, by the first event being some other, uh, some other event, what happens is the probability changes. Probability of somebody having a local relapse changes if you take the number at risk, okay? So that is a problem. They are, if you assume that to be a, a independent process, then that, 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 does not provide a proper inference. So newer methods were developed to handle these problems, okay? Some more example I have given here is like chronic graft versus host disease relapse. You can have more than one type of competing events. Uh, you can have in a bone marrow transplant situation, you can have a CVHD, uh, chronic graft versus host disease. You can have a relapse of the disease coming back or death can be coming back uh, when, so there, there can be a lot of issues, okay? So there are two ways to think about it. One is ignoring competing risk, how to analyze the, the problem uh, when you have such a situation, okay? So if you're, if you use, ignore the competing risk, what are the methods available for us to utilize? So they are standard survival analysis, uh, which are kaplan meyer Lagrange test and um, Cox models, um, which in fact assumes competing risks are absent. So when we are using the, uh, the standard methods, what we do is, we are treating the other competing risk event as censored. So if you're, if you're analyzing a data, normally if you have a status variable uh, in the data, you have a time variable and a status variable, you would code. So this is the event of interest. You would code this one as one, other cause of death as zero and somebody who is alive as zero. 
and you will run an analysis. So what it means is like you're, you're saying that other cause of death, somebody who had a death or can have additional death due to cardiovascular. Logically, that, is, that, is, that doesn't make any sense, right? So somebody who died cannot have, so they are dependent censoring, but when we assume them as independent censoring, then there is a problem, okay? So what this does under this scenario is it impacts the kaplan Mayer estimates. What it makes is by, by treating the sensor in uh, the other cause of death as censoring, the kaplan Mayer estimates what you estimated, now they do not, they are not probabilities. Okay, they no longer are probabilities because, uh, okay, uh, and there are other issues. The addition of, so the only thing, one way you can think about is you can, people use the SFT uh, as the kaplan Mayer estimates, which is the common one we use. The one way to deal with, it, deal with it is one minus S of T, which gives you the, this is the probability of T greater than T, which is the complement of this would be, uh, which will provide you the distribution function. Okay, this is the incidence function, incidence of the, the problem being, the event being happening. Okay, so, but the problem is by using a standard couple mayor estimate for computing these incidents, uh, there are at times what happens is when you calculate the incidents using the kaplan Mayer estimates, the probabilities can, when you add up for each type of event, can go over one. So that's why I say that kaplan Mayer estimates calc by, through which we are calculating the, the addition of each of the event probabilities when it crosses one, then it's no longer a probability. So that is the issue with using a survival analysis, regular survival analysis for a competing risk problem. So how do we deal with it? So one way to do, there are the analysis not ignoring. So instead of in ignoring the competing risk, we take care of the competing risk, okay? Uh, so there are two major ways people use it. Uh, one through uh, uh, cost-specific hazard function, which is nothing but uh, regular, uh, regular uh, survival analysis procedures. Uh, it, then the second one, is through a sub-distribution hazard function, okay? So uh, today, like the next, all following slides, I'm going to talk about the, most of them are sub-distribution hazard, the, uh, the procedures based on sub-distribution hazard function. The competing risk problem as, as indicated uh, is a problem where it, each subject can experience one of many outcomes under the study, okay? If that is the case, then instead of dealing with the um, ignoring the competing risk, it is easier to deal with the problem which can, uh, which can handle all the events, all the type of events. So some of these procedures are uh, the basic descriptive statistics commonly used is called cumulative incidence function. Uh, again, Carl Fish uh, came up with um, uh, some splitting up the incidence function separately. Um, for comparing test, um, a commonly used test is GRACE test, which is a modified log, log rank test. Um, but there is also another test called um, Pepe and Mori's test. So um, that's available as well, um, and some of this. When it comes to modeling, people use two type of models. Uh, one is a fine and gray model, which is a modified Cox proportional asset model, which is based on uh, sub-distribution, okay? Uh, it, which is based on uh, the hazard function derived from a sub-distribution rather than from the full distribution. 
Uh, then uh, the other one is the cost specific as a regression, which is nothing but a regular survival analysis, but you repeat it for every time. You might ask why you said just a minute ago, you cannot use uh, survival, uh, regular survival analysis uh, technique, but now you're saying people use it under cost specific, different heading they use cost specific hazard regression. Uh, there is a reason behind it. When the researchers interest is uh, etiologic or biologic, they wanted to understand the biologic me mechanism, then the cost specific asset function gives you a better idea what happens to each type of event, okay? On the other hand, if the interest is more on the incidence or you're trying to find risk factors or prognos prognostic criteria, then you're, you use the subdistribution asset function type models, which are fine gray model. <coughs> I want to uh, give the basics, the descriptives, statistics for um, uh, uh, how, do, how to compute it or how, how do you use it um, uh, under competing risk situation. The commonly used function for that, which is similar to like how commonly we use the kaplan meyer estimate, the cumulative incidence function is the one which we commonly use under when you have a competing risk problem. Okay, um, so the definition basically, if you think about it, CIF is a form of uh, one minus the SFT. Uh, the difference is um, the estimation of this cumulative incident function allows for accounting for the competing risk, allows the, calculates the incidence of occurrence of an event while taking into account uh, the competing risks. How does that, how, how it does that is using a sub, uh, sub distribution, okay, um, in the risk set, okay. The another good property of the cumulative incident function is that the sum of the CIF estimates will give you the CIF estimate for the composite outcome. That means, what I mean here is, if you have three different type of events, type one, two, and three, so CIF one, CIF two, CIF three, if you add them, it'll give you CIF all, if you calculate all, it'll give you addition of this. But this will not be the same case under regular survival analysis case. So that's a good property, what the cumulative incidence function has, okay? Uh, one of the criticism always when you use a regular cost specific uh, hazard type estimate, the probability incidence computed out of the kaplan meyer estimate is always when you calculate it, the estimates calculated using this is always greater than the composite kaplan meyer estimate. So that is not good. So, so this is a very good property in terms of our descriptive statistics and especially it allows you to provide you the right answer, okay? So how, what is the mechanism behind this cumulative incidence function, which relies on the subdistribution? I'll try to explain it um, quickly. So if you have T1, T2, T3 up to TR, are the ordered time points of all event types. So it can be any number of event types. They can be one, even type one, even type two. You just order them over, okay? Then you indicate uh, 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 the D, which is the number of events of type I. So that's the I is the type occurring at time J. So that means you're saying like, uh, you're saying in a, in a equation, like in a follow-up, this is the jth time. So here you can have an event type one, okay? So this is j plus one time, you will have event type two. So there is also an implicit assumption that 
at each time point okay you can have only only one type of event okay assuming that uh, the limit goes very small uh, the events whatever occurring at that particular spot is at the time point j you can have only one type of event which is under the study okay so dij represents the number of events normally you are thinking about one event the nj is the number at risk at or before tj so if you are saying the time tj so people should not have had any event up to until this time point this is similar to survival analysis but only difference is in survival analysis if somebody has censored before okay out of that not specific to that type of event then you get rid of that people like the risk set will change here this is the difference in the subject this is why the this is called the subdistribution it takes a number at risk at or at or before tj but this includes individuals those who not only who have experienced the type of the event i this should be a small i but also on individuals not experienced any other type of event okay so you are adding both you are keeping them so <clears throat> sft is a regular kaplan meier probability of event we calculate so when you calculate the cumulative incidence function what it happens is so this is a regular probability kaplan meier probability but this estimate this risk set the sub is the one which makes a sub distribution where you have patients or participants who are alive up to that point whether they are they if 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 they are at risk other than they are uh, other than the uh, other type of events so i would say okay so i'm going to show that using a simple for uh, data set this is a bone marrow transplant data uh, from this the study is presented at a very good book practical book called uh, competing risk practical perspective of pintili melania pintili from canada uh, which was published in uh, wiley in 2006 i think yeah 2006 they present a subsample of data it's a on multi center randomized controlled trial for myeloid mal malignancy um, between the who underwent bone marrow transplant between 1996 and 2000 uh, in the study a total of 228 patients participated but for the analysis i think um, i i am using the uh, the book database so i am using only 100 samples which is from a particular specific center i think princess margaret health center or something like that uh, i'm also using uh, in that study what they try to do is to compare two two type of treatments common approach uh, where uh, they transplanted the cells harvested from pelvic bone of the donor and they tried another newer method where cells were collected from the peripheral blood okay so they were trying it and there are you can see that uh, uh the main studies is uh, neutrophil recovery but um, you can also consider the 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 book and um, they consider other outcomes as well as a competing risk relapse is one of the 100 patients they have five relapsed uh, 86 had um, chronic, chronic uh, graft versus host disease five died and four patients did not have any event at all okay they were just regular sensor uh, the cumulative incidence function what i showed before can be easily now a lot of packages packages in r that's it um so uh, so are the regular packages like uh, sas sas used to have macros to run it uh, now they you can you can get it out of like you can trick the ph rec function to get all these things and life test function to get the cumulative incident function 
And I think Stata has a exclusive, uh, they have also built in competing risk uh, uh, modules into it. So I'm just showing it here, the competing risk for the bone. Uh, I'm using a competing risk library function to calculate it. Um, there are other libraries where you can use, um, uh, you can call functions to compute com the same type of analysis. Um, I can, off the top of my head, I can think about as something like time rig is one, um, one package. I think multi-state model packages, I think MSM or MSSM, I think they should be able to allow you to do computing risk as well. Um, I think uh, Terry Theron News, uh, uh, I think their survival package also involves some kind of competing risk. So you, 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 there are many packages in R which allows you to get the cumulative incidence function. Now let's go into and see. So it's easy to fit it. Basically you create a function, okay? Um, this is like a cumulative incidence. I ink is the command for getting the cumulative incidence uh, the probability is uh, our incidence function for like incidence estimates uh, for each of the outcomes. So as I said, the, the variable, we use the, the time variable, which is minimum of, uh, so minimum of time between relapse, uh, chronic graft versus host disease, uh, you have death, Okay, so single time and um, so last to follow. Okay, and the censoring had censoring event had like uh, you have status instead of normally in the survival packages or any program, what will use is zero or one. One means even, zero means censored. But in this, we have additional codes that means zero, one, two, and three. So that's what represented here. I think one is CVA. Uh, CVGHD, uh, sorry, CGVHD. I think two is relapse and three is death. So this gives you an estimate. So normally when you call in a function, it will give you an estimate. So this is over uh, 0.5 of an year. Uh, that means like six months, okay? So this is six months, one year, 1 1.5 years, uh, basically in 2.5 years that's what that's that's what it gives uh two point like 2.5 years that 18 months 6 12 uh this is 18 months and um, 24 months so over the period so it estimates what is the incidence for having chronic um gv um graft versus hostesis so you can see that uh, because uh that is increasing a lot but while the relapse and they are pretty much stable and it provides you a variance estimate as well. Uh, then there's a nice way to represent this. This is nothing but if you're, uh, if you're using a, you can think this as one minus the couple of Meyer estimate, but uh, this is the, this plot is corrected for the competing risk, okay? So if you're plotting uh, in SAS or Stata, um, I think SAS, if, if you're using Kaplan Meyer regular estimates, what you need to do is you need to run each one of them separately. And I think you can, you have to combine the estimates and plot it in SAS at least. So by asking for plot cumulative incidence, uh, what it provides you just, it calls for the fit function and it provides you all three. So because we have only five patients each, you can see the, the lines are very small here. So the relapse had some, some number, but the depth is pretty much slow. So, and it stops there. So you can see the uh, amount of cumulative incidence. Okay. <clears throat> you can also think that um, normally we are always interested in not just the overall cumulative incidence, uh, we are interested, always interested in comparing groups, okay? So comparing groups, normally we do if comparing by race, comparing by gender, or comparing by intervention arms. Um, so here I, I'm plotting the, uh, the 
um, the cumulative incidence function for uh, chronic graft versus host disease, um, assuming like, so I, I, I use that and uh, I, I would ask for an only difference between the pr previous slide and this one is now I am adding one more covariate where it's the intervention now. Okay, so I said that uh, one of the things is uh, the study used the bone marrows, which is the common standard standard of care, and they also wanted to check if the peripheral blood works. So, <clears throat> so I used that variable as a two groups to see uh, how whether we can plot what is the difference between these two groups uh, in the chronic. Uh, post disease. So if you look at it, uh, the, 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 CBA, the CVGHT, chronic graft versus host disease, increases steeply uh, faster than the, uh, the bone marrow group. This is the bone marrow group, um, but they are not statistically significant. They are not changing much. They are in the same direction. They are went up to and most of them had the chronic uh, graft versus host disease by six months. So you can see that. So I also, by asking the cumulative incidence function, um, if you add the command called time points, you can ask for a particular time point. You can list the list of time points. So I'm asking for six months and nine months because most of them died, like had that event before one year. So what are the probabilities if I'm comparing by uh, com com comparing two? So if you're looking at it like 73, 73% or 73% um, they had like more compared to six, 64%. Similarly, this is 81% compared to. So you get to know for each of these groups uh, what, what happened between these two groups, okay? each of the events, like basically this one means uh, the uh, chronic uh, graft versus host disease, two means relapse, okay, and three means uh, basically uh, that's death, okay. So you can see death is higher at six months uh, for for the uh, bone marrow group uh, compared to the uh, the peripheral blood group. Uh, similarly, the relapse also a little bit higher, but for chronic uh, graft uh, versus host disease, uh, bone marrow has a lower uh, incidence compared to the peripheral blood. So that's how you interpret it. <clears throat> uh, I'm mentioned that, so the, the one which I showed is just the plot, it's a cumulative incident comparison plot, um, but we also like to always present uh, a test associated with that, whether the two groups, okay, uh, whether the, the incidence of um, all the events, what you're looking at, either relapse or death or chronic graft versus host disease, are they different between the two groups, bone marrow and peripheral blood group. So good thing is um, the cum in function uh, incorporates the Gray's test, okay? Uh, Gray's, Gray proposed a case sample test that, com that compares weighted averages of as a, of a subdistribution function. So it, it uses a weight to, com uh, to modify the, um, log rank test. So that's why it's a modified log rank test and it uses weights, okay? Uh, and uh, the function gives you three statistics. It's a chi-square chi -square test uh, and it gives you chi-square test and uh, p-values. So none of them are significant. Okay. So if you look at it, uh, chronic uh, graft versus host disease, if you're looking at it, uh, that's the that that's 0.15, that p-values, that means the intervention group, they are not different at all. 
okay? Uh, but in some scenarios, other studies which you are involved in might be significant. Um, uh, you can also, um, you can also change the cumin function. Like if you want to analyze a certain type of event, uh, if you want to specifically mention it, or if you want to change the sensor encoding, it allows you to do. So in um, that's why I, I wanted to mention that here is like um, sensor encoding um, is zero. So I wanted to mention that if you, uh, if you have a data where the sensor, sensor encoding is not zero, but it is five, we can say send code is five then it'll compute automatically with that. So that's a good feature of this package. Um, now I'll move on to the, um, the major modeling of uh, covariates to assess the incidence, okay? Uh, basically, um, basically what, the, what we are trying to do is uh, we are trying to model the incidence or modeling the hazard of a subdistribution instead of calling uh, incidents, uh, adjusting for competing risk. So the subdistribution function by itself is a modified function accounts which accounts for competing risk. So you are modeling the hazard computed out of that subdistribution function. That's what uh, Fine and Jason Fine and Gray. Uh, uh, published in 1999, uh, did the model. The model pretty much looks like exactly like a Cox proportional hazard model. So you can think this as a uh, modified Cox proportional hazards model uh, where the gamma, okay, is the hazard. So it's basically, if you're writing the Cox proportional hazards model, you'll write like lambda naught of t, it's exactly looks the same, okay? So this is the hazard out of the subdistribution. Uh, this is the baseline hazard of the subdistribution and the rest of them are uh, like Cox model. It's the covariates which you are going to throw in. And you also estimate the, uh, estimate the parameters using a partial likelihood function. Okay, normally you're going to do a score equation out of the partial likelihood. So that's where you will find the difference. Uh, if the weight is same, if the weight, so this function, what, what it makes is different is, uh, it involves a weight, okay? Uh, and the, the, the risk set basically is out of a subdistribution, okay? So that is the change basically, uh, from the regular, if the weights are equal to one, okay, fine and gray model is equal to the Cox model, Cox proportional hazards model. Okay, if all the weights are same, that means if you have like, uh, if you don't have any competing risk, then the weights are one, okay? So, uh, and it becomes a regular Cox proportional hazards model and, uh, and you estimate it. So what does this weight literally means? Uh, is basically, uh, if you have if you have a type I, okay. Uh, if you're looking at so basically you're looking at uh, this is the it, this is sort of an inverse probability censoring weighting approach, and it's exactly prob inverse probability of censoring, but it's a much stable weight. So you calculate. Uh, probability of using a survival procedure, you can calculate this weights. If you want to manually do it, uh, you calculate instead of modeling an event, you will model the sensor, censoring, sen censoring event and calculate the couple and mayor probabilities. So, so you'll, so sense equal to zero. So, and similarly for time TI, not time TI, this is at, for the type type of event i at time t, you are trying to compare it with any other event, whichever event, if some other event type has occurred, okay? So in our case, in the bone marrow transplant, it can be a relapse. If you are modeling i, you are using that estimate the censoring for if you're, uh, if you're whatever the minimum of the time, you calculate it and get the weight there. So that gives you the 
subdistribution model, okay, which can be modeled using again uh, uh, out of the package where um, basically you can calculate uh, the cumulative incidence uh, or subdistribution rate regression model here. Okay, so it's easy to do is like out of the, the I'm still using the BMT data. Uh, the fine and gray model is basically uh, your, your fitting, I'm using one variable at a time in this slide. So I'm just fitting the time, the censoring variable I'm putting in and a time variable, uh, not time, it's treatment variable, where one means, uh, I'm using one as uh, the peripheral blood because it's the new treatment uh, and zero is the bone marrow regular. So you can see that um, this is the estimate for combined across, okay? Combined across events. So basically if you're modeling for the CVHD and the other events, basically uh, you're trying to get an estimate so this is the coefficient. So e to the power 0 0.3, if you put, so normally that is the um, hazard ratio or sub, sub, sub hazard ratio based on um, sub-distribution, okay? Um, you get, and the p-value gives you the standard error and the p-value there. So that's the, that's the model fine grape post adjusting for other competing risk, okay? So that's one. So you might ask, like, you can add as many covariates in this uh, thing. Um, so one way to do is I'm showing you with an example where uh, I combined a variable called X, okay? Uh, I combined the covariates, like you can have as many number of variables here. I'm using that, so I, I put a matrix, um, matrix of 100 by two, that means you have uh, 100, one column of uh, treatment variable, one column of age variable, okay? And I, you just need to, all you need to do is call in the function called um, the CRR function and um, put in the variable X, then it will give you convergence and it will give you the p-values. You can see by adding the age variable, uh, the, the risk increased. Okay, the risk of the, the, the cumulative incidence, like uh, the, the rate, rate of incidence uh, increases among the peripheral blood group compared to the bone marrow group. Okay, especially the, the, because this is derived for the, uh, this is more for the, what do you call um, chronic versus, because that's the 86 of the uh, 100 patients had a chronic graft versus host disease. So that drives the thing, okay? So you, you can ask for a different code also. If you want to have a different different event, you want to model, you can ask for that model too. For each event type, it, it'll model. So normally if it is a default, what it does is whatever the code one is, that will be taken as an event. So it, this gives you a chronic graft versus host disease, the, the rate ratios or hazard ratios, whichever you're comfortable with. So it gives you a coefficient for that, um, that particular default event, adjusting for other competing risks, okay? That's, that's one thing, okay? Um, <clears throat> I do want to specify, I don't want to go into, I don't want to create a confusion. Uh, in certain scenarios, I mentioned that uh, even though survival analysis is not appropriate for it, if the researcher's interest is more uh, to understand the biologic mechanism for each of the, each of the, what do you call, uh, uh, um, each of the type of events, okay? Uh, then, then you can run a regular survival analysis, which is called a cost-specific hazard form, because you are treating each event of interest as one and 
assuming that all other events are censored. Okay, so you are ignoring them. So it's cost specific. So if your interest is that, then you can use this regression based on uh, survival analysis, regular survival analysis. Um, and here is a comparison of the same same BMT study. So I mentioned that the previous slide was for only uh, chronic graft versus host disease. Okay, if you want to calculate uh, uh, for each of the events, if you want to do, you can do that. So the basic, like how I said in the previous slide, uh, what I did like uh, here send code, okay? The same, same type, what it allows is like uh, the model where when it comes, when you put this, you can put fail code, okay? Fail code, if you change this, if I don't put anything, it'll take one, if I add, if you want to add an event, like if I want to make a code, like for the calculate the, the ratios or the estimate, parameter estimates, then I can say two. So that's what uh, I did for lab. So CVHD was the event type one. And this was, I combined death and relapse to be two. So I, I put that into one thing. I, I did the same thing with cost specific. So we can compare the results. You can see that uh, the p-values, none of them are significant. In, uh, so if you look at it, okay. So the estimates, look at the estimates. Okay, specifically, this is for chronic graft versus host disease. Uh, the risk, if risk of um, incident uh, CVA is CGVHT, uh, in the peripheral blood group is e to the power 0.31. So e to the power 0.31, if you run the fine and gray model. So that would be what, um, like, uh, it's like, hold on, uh, let me compute it. Well, uh, 0.3, my, my phone is not working, okay. So if I'm using the, for example, let me, let me compute it quickly. So e to the power 0.3, uh, would be 1.3 times, but if you use the same thing in a cost specific asset model, it'll give you a 0.1. So it's, this is 1.3. This gives you an estimate of 1.3. Let's say as a ratio or asset function subdistribution, this give, gives you 1.1, okay? So for here, it didn't change because there are very few events, but you can see the difference in the estimate. So it can have a major impact when you're modeling it. Um, so you want to take, make sure that your research question, you're appropriate like what you're using. So here are the recommendations uh, for analyzing competing risk data. data. Um, First thing I wanted to say is like, um, make a decision, like look for a, like, what is your specific question of interest uh, based on which you will, you should select the model. Uh, the decision of the model, if your decision is to get a etiologic or biologic reasoning, then you can use a cost specific as a regression. But if your interest is in calculating the incidence and calculating prognostic criteria, prognostic based, prognosis based uh, criteria, then use a, a sub hazard based regression. Um, this should be cumulative incidence function. Normally, oops, uh, this should be one line. Cumulative incident function should be used to estimate the incidence of each type of competing risks. Uh, this is same, so, if you're if you're going to if you have a competing risk problem, 
present as a descriptive statistics, please present cumulative incidents, incidences. And uh, along with the charts and you can use, uh, I, you can also use the modified um, log rank test, grace test, or Pepe and Morris test. Uh, again, if your interest is uh, incidents or prediction or prognosis, uh, use the fine and gray sub distribution hazard model. Okay. Uh, but when the focus is on addressing etiology questions, then use the cost specific hazard model. Uh, but there are scenarios sometimes you want to analyze both models and present it as well. So uh, I, I, I'm not going to say choose one. Most of the like uh, most common scenarios which normally come, come under which you are interested in are the incidences. So normally choose the straight, uh, fine and gray model, but some scenarios you might want to present both, okay? Um, so I'll stop there. And uh, here are the some of the very common um, thing. There are other uh, books, recent books have come out uh, about multi-state models, um, looking competing risk uh, under the kind of multi-state model framework. Um, so you might want to have, a, if you are encountering uh, a problem with competing risk, uh, please uh, check those books as well. So I'll take any questions now. I'll stop here. Hello? People who wanted to ask questions, please unmute your mic and then please raise your questions. Uh, this is one um, uh, chat from Marimuthu. Uh, can you see that chat? Um, I'm just looking at it. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are assumptions. I did. I sorry, I forgot to mention it. Um, so the same as like uh, the fine and gray model, since it's a modified um, pro proportional hazards model, you, you you can check the proportionality assumptions under um, under um, under uh, fine and gray model. Normally, you do it with uh, um, what do you call? Uh, uh, the residuals so you can plot the like you can do a z uh, z test uh, like um, um, Frank Harrell's test basically or you can plot um, scon uh, like a uh, residual plotting and see how the distributions are so you can do that so I did have somewhere I mentioned yeah can check proportion proportionality of using residuals so. That's uh, that you want to do similar to pretty much similar to what we do with the um, Cox proportional hazards model. Uh, sir, I am Dr. Jagadnath. Uh, I would like to know why it is uh, something this is not a fine and gray model is known as sub distribution hazards model. Because, because it, it is based on a um, sub distribution. So hold on, let me go back to this slide here. So it, it, it's arrived, the, the risk set, okay? Risk set now, uh, is a little bit different. Risks, risk set in a, like a, so if you have, let, let me think about it. Um, so, if you have 20 individuals, um, if you are using events there, if, if you have three or four people censored in a regular kaplan Mayer survival, they won't be part of the risk set as you progress. Uh, but, for, but for the sub-distribution, what you do is the risk set is you will include them, whoever 
had um, censored, not censored, whoever had an event uh, other than the type of uh, what you are interested in looking at for each of those event is like that. So that's why it's called a sub, sub distribution hazard, the hazard based, for, based on the sub distributions. Thank you, sir. Hello, Professor Shankar. Yes. Yeah, sir. Sir, my name is Nitin. Sir, I'm just interested to know uh, when we are trying to select a correct a correct model for evaluation. Mm -hmm. When do we decide that we should go for a parametric model, semi-parametric model, or non-parametric model? What are the underlying bases that we try to bucket into each one of them? So, if you ask me. Parametric model, if your assumptions are correct, parametric models are far superior than semi-parametric and non-parametric. Okay. Uh, but the problem with that is getting the this distributional assumptions correct, getting we, in real life, most times we may not have all the assumptions met. Right. So in those scenarios like, uh, uh, it's, it's better to go for the other types. But again, you need to be ca cautious, like uh, certain parametric models may not converge or you need additional requirements. Um, the interpretations um, might be, uh, in, it's not the interpretation, mainly the assumptions are the major role. So um, you want to, and also you are, design or the values might dictate what type of models you want to choose. Yeah, so Dr. Shankar, I'll, I'll take an example. Mm -hmm. So when we look at this Ewing sarcoma, it is it is one of a bone tumor. Mm -hmm. it, it have a peak from age of three to nine. And then there is a peak from 60 to 65. Okay. And it looks like a, it, it looks like uh, you have a bimodal. Yes, sir. Car. Yes. Yeah, then you need to go for whichever like a regression model that allows you to fit a bimodal regression. And again, your outcome of interest, or if you're looking in terms of other angle, you can look at think in terms of a bathtub function. You can look at it like you have a, if you're starting from three, it's high. And it just goes like this and goes up again. It looks like a bathtub function. So it's like a Gompertz distribution or something. All right. You try to choose a, choose a model that allows you to answer your research question. So, so the answer, the question which we are looking at is, mm -hmm. if suppose there is a child who is six years old, mm -hmm. suffers in living sarcoma, mm -hmm. In the distal end femur, so it's so in the distal end of the thigh bone. Can can you repeat that? Uh, what what do you mean by that? So I mean, so, so I I mean to say that Ewing sarcoma, it's a tumor mm -hmm. which occurs mm -hmm. in the distal end of the thigh bone. Okay, and we remove it. Okay, and similarly we do a removal in a fifty five year old. Okay. And then, and then we might be having 200 patients, those who are six to nine years old. And then there would be similar around 200 patients, those who are 55 years and above. And now we, now we are interested to look in the relapse. Okay. So your interest is time to relapse. You can, you can, uh, th there are two ways to look at it, right? You, you say as a binary outcome, uh, as relapse, yes or no, okay. or time to, time to relapse. Right. Uh, Interesting. If the yeah. earlier version you would use a like it's a, a logistic regression or a binomial, reg binomial regression or something you can use. But again, it doesn't take into account uh, like uh, the time factor. But if you are looking at a time factor, then you'll use a Cox type model. But if you're saying the peak is that that is nothing to do with the type of model here. 
because that's more the occurrences of the disease yeah not towards your relapse outcome so that but, sir, doesn't but, have an uh, but, sir, that doesn't dictate your is, model sorry yeah someone who, is, someone who is six years old mm -hmm. then then that person gonna live say suppose a normal human life up till say around 60 years so the possibility mm -hmm. of getting a relapse is relatively higher for mm -hmm. a child compared to a person who is a 55 year old and getting a relapse mm -hmm. there so i think i think there is a difference between the two and and even even the bimodal peak distribution also need to be accounted when we are looking into the relapse part uh you can stratify the age group so i have seen in uh, other cancer studies where people uh older age group tend to die faster so they split the yeah. age group so you just, you need to stratify them and you fit a model whichever model which fit so you you can fit a model if you think death is not uh, how, how what is the uh, prognosis uh, of this after treatment like what what is the survival rate of uh, of the patients uh, with this type of uh, tumor so the survival so the survival rate since, since this evening sarcoma is a chemo sensitive tumor so the patient mm -hmm. need to be given a chemotherapy three cycles mm -hmm. before the surgery and then surgery is undertaken now depending upon the margins of the mm -hmm. surgery then mm -hmm. even post operative chemotherapy is planned and the results are remarkably good then it comes okay so so that's what I, I was looking at uh, uh, so if the results are good then uh, so you don't expect death in the um, death in the younger population that often right so you don't right. need it so you can it can be a regular cox type model but on the other hand if you're looking at uh, death due to this tumor can occur in older population or death due to other causes can then you can think in terms of a competing risk so okay or it, because relapse you are saying death from other causes because they are old can come so that that calls for a competing risk in a older 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 age group right, right. So, so so there's a possibility since they can die because of other things also that's why competing yeah. is right yes okay yeah. okay your event of interest is relapse but yeah. they may not uh, they may not live longer enough to see the relapse because yeah. your you you your treatment response is very good so in that case like eventually if they live longer they would see a relapse but death has like terminated that one so that's a yeah yeah and, and so when you said when you said that while choosing a correct parametric model in such cases we can use a gombits distribution but sir but no sir, no, no, no 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 i said like I, I was thinking that your outcome was uh distributed that way the time time okay. event okay. but yeah, it's yeah. more it's not the time it's it's basically you you are talking about uh, the 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 age group where this uh, the sarcoma comes yeah. is like kind of a, like a bathtub yeah yeah, yeah. and answer so the last question when we look at this goodness of fit test mm -hmm. so how 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 this test is relevant for semi parametric and non parametric models does it matter there or it doesn't matter there can you can you repeat that one please Sorry. So, so i'll say sir when when we look at this goodness of fit test Mm -hmm. So, is it relevant for semi-parametric and non-parametric models, or yes, it doesn't matter? Yes, they there? do. Yeah, they do, uh, because uh, normally it means most of most of them. You, you there are different ways to check it out, right? So, goodness yeah. of fit tests are like what type of tests you are using. Yeah, you can use a score test to test. Most of these are score equations, so you can get a score equation based test. Like uh, if you are doing a Cox regression. Yeah. you can get a score score equation based score test goodness of fit test um so it's relevant yeah. normally you try to find how good is your test yeah. how how good is your fit yeah thank you so much sir thank you no problem yeah oh, shankar there is a comment from uh, dr rajmohan who is a uh, director of amphil program from trivandrum can you see the uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yes hello dr rajmohan how are you <laughs> so um, yeah, we can use a uh, viable uh, if you're thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very, very useful uh, level of 
presentation, uh, even though it was not, uh, I asked my colleagues, they said it is little high above. We hope you, you will make more simpler presentations about survival analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure, sure, you. sure. Good to, good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, the Weibo we can do, but as far as the time is, the hazard is increasing or decreasing, depending upon that, you can, you can always use Weibo. If the hazard is like, again, the, uh, uh, if the hazard is uh, same, uh, it is easier to fit a Co Cox model, which is like you're assuming a flat, right? So um, you can use, a, certainly you can, if you're talking about, okay, let me go back. Uh, generally, we have Weibull for survey. What is the distribution for survey? It's a non-parametric based model. So it's not, we are not assuming any parametric. Uh, so it's a non-parametric based, uh, the sub-distribution model is a non-parametric model. You're estimating it's like a Cox model. So you're estimating it uh, separately. So it doesn't assume any particular distribution. You can certainly, I think people have come up with some parametric competing risk models. In that case, you might use a variable distribution or an exponential distribution, if that is what you're asking. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, the fine and gray model is like, a, it's an extended Cox model. So uh, it is using a non-parametric version of the distribution, so basically. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Dr. Shankar? Yeah. Yeah, so when you, when you said that, uh, so the people, those who are elderly, when they suffer from this evening sarcoma, possibly then we use a competing risk model. Mm -hmm. Suppose if we are interested to look into the, the disease pre survival, sir, at that time would accelerated failure time model would be relatively more relevant compared to Cox proportional hazard models. It, it depends upon your question, right? If you, if you think your covariates are going to have an impact over the hazard, then you can use an uh, AFT model. Um, but if it is not, then then a Cox should be fine. Right. And and when we when we look at uh, suppose when we design a regression equation, and then we say this is this is like H T is equal to H not T plus uh, then 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 there are this. Uh, the multipliers and the covariates present. So my basic understanding says that all these, when they are present additive to each other, then the multiplier would be able to tell only the additive part of it. Or, or does it go anywhere else also? Does it, does it tell about even the multiplier effect also? Am I able to say something or did I know? What, what, what do you mean by multiplier effect? It's like, so the, the, they, they are relate, relative risks. If you yeah. think in terms of it is giving a multi, the effect measure is, is relative. If you are using an additive rate model, then the, uh, it's, it, it's in the additive scale, in an absolute scale, if that is what you're asking. So can you if you are again? interested, can if you're you interested, you know, if your interest is, uh, like a fold increase compared, say, if you have a treatment group versus control group, if you're interested in relative increase change, yeah, okay, relative change, then you use a multiplicative models like a right. Cox model or odds ratios are like that, right? Right. But if you are not interested in a multiplicative or relative uh, effects, but you're more interested in absolute effects, what is the number of people who are affected? like that, then you will go for a additive rate model or additive regression models, basically. Yeah, yeah. Got it, sir. Got it. Thank that you. gives you a rate difference. Right, sir. There's another comment from, from Arimutu, the chat box. Oh, okay. Uh, I do not know <laughs> where um, situation, both models will, you are talking about the fine and gray model and uh, uh, 
the the cost proportional assets model not so finding green and uh, cost specific models yeah so uh, so you, if you don't have competing risk then they'll give you the same results okay, okay. If, if you because uh, literally if you don't have any competing risks you can try that in a software so if you don't have any competing risk it should give you exactly the same result because uh, your censoring is exactly the same. The risk set will be exactly the same. The weights will be one. Probability for censoring weighting will be one. So that becomes a regular partial likelihood equation of Cox. So that, that, that should give you the same answer. But if you have a competing risk, because of the correlated nature, it's not going to give you similar results. At oh, least in the variation variability part. Yeah. Okay, sir. But on the, can you please show the uh, slide seventeen? Hello, sir. This is the, this is the one, right? Uh, yes, sir. Here, if you see this. Yeah. Go. Uh, here uh, in the uh, chronic CVHD is here X2 is H. Is it mm -hmm. same or different? Sir? Here the it's the same, same, exactly uh, the same variable. Uh, it's exactly what the same asking, variable. Yeah. Yes, sir. And what I'm asking is when at when at what situation the X here the X2 uh, for H and the X2 coefficients are almost same, no? Yeah, but decimal varies, but you see the rest of them. Okay. But yeah, but if you also see the standard errors, okay, the standard error, um, like uh, there's a slight change in the standard error. This is a very small data and you had like predominant uh, chronic graft versus host disease. So it might drive, but if you, if you are, if you are competing risk, if you have a larger data set, if your competing risks are as there are many of them, then you might have a variable things. Okay, okay, thank you, sir. Thank the you. bias is small. Here, the bias is very pretty big. So this one is pretty big. Oh. For this, because they are very small, even, even there is at least like 0 0.84, 0 0.88 versus 0.84. Over a period of like thing, it, it can have a major impact. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shankar? Yes. So, sir, would you please reiterate yesterday when you talk about type one censoring and type two censoring? Can you mm -hmm. what was that? Can you can you just reiterate once? Yeah. So one is based on uh, the number of events. Uh, the other one is based on calendar time. The type one is based on calendar time normally. Uh, like say you start a study Jan like uh, 2005, you started and you'll end every follow-up by. So normally in a survival studies, you there is a accrual period and you have a follow-up period. Right. So normally you plan a study, a clinical trial, cancer clinical trial if I'm doing, Normally, I'll say I have a, like I get like five patients per year. Uh, normally, if it is a multi-center study, you want bigger number, you do a multi-center study. Um, five patients, like if we have hundred patients, so we get involved fifty centers and we we get that hundred patient within two years. Then we have a three-year follow-up or four-year follow-up. Right. So your study ends irrespective of whatever the outcomes or study, unless there is an interim analysis and you're stopping for futility or um, efficacy issues, uh, you stop based on a calendar time. That's so or whoever will have the ma major one will be maximum will be if somebody started the first day you recruited somebody, the maximum time they can have yeah. is five years if they don't yeah. have any. So that's a type one. The second type is like you recruit again, same study, it's based on the number of events, okay? So you're going to say there are a lot of major pharmaceutical studies 
how does they do how do how they set it up is such a way that based on the number of events say they will design it such a way that i will recruit like 500 patient if i have 80 progression free survivals i'll stop the study yeah at any point so even somebody like after like if i if i start over a period of 2 years accrual will start stop there then you have a follow up by the time follow up like if you have 80 then you stop the study there that's it mm-hmm. right. so your follow up is going to be a little bit smaller and so how do they get this magic number say 80 how how do these follow up no, it's it's a sample size calculation normally like like regular sample size calculation okay. i just okay. yeah yeah uh, it has normally you calculate it and you have to base like norm sample size calculation for survival analysis involves not only the the rates and differences but also the accrual time and the follow up time so you need to yeah. put those things inside yeah and so just 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 one last request so can you can you mention a uh, a good book for cancer epidemiology cancer epidemiology there, there are a lot of books if you're looking at cancer clinical trials there are just thinking uh if you're looking for hold on so if you're looking in terms of a clinical trial book this is a good book it's a cancer clinical trial okay for oncology but if you're looking at epidemiology there are a lot behavior either you are looking at behavioral epidemiology related to cancer or uh, there are many more areas now split right so right you need to be like depends upon your interest yeah the survival analysis in cancer that, that that's my interest oh uh, you you can take any major books so most of them like uh, you, you, you can breslow and days book the classic books they only deal with cancers there um uh, what's that's a breslow and days breslow and day arthur norman breslow and day statistical I, i don't remember the name exactly sure, 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 sure. thank you yeah. volume 1 and volume 2 should talk about the methods and related to all the methodology right. thank you any other questions comments so if you don't have any other less a situation both not okay um we'll stop here we uh, shankar we thank you very much for your wonderful presentation is a feast for the statisticians who have been working on survival analysis and uh, we request you to give uh, more such presentations for the statistics community here uh, i'm sure we'll try to make it more simpler so for the clinical epidemiologists also can get benefited in future we'll write you the topics and request your time in future as well. Thank you very so much. Thanks very for inviting up. me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.